dead, but I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. When he said that, it took, I took a lot of hope in it because we had uh, Clinton in the office, and, and then, uh, then we, I thought maybe he was probably right when we had George Bush in, and then, then we had um, Barack Obama in, and I questioned whether or not it was true. If, if America, if the demographics of America would put any, I, I, I wondered who would we vote in? What unknown would we vote in? What person w with no um, uh, experience would we put in the Oval Office? But then when that election night 2016 took place and I had prophesied his, his win and I saw how he was neck and neck in, in, in North Carolina and neck and neck in Florida and neck and neck in Michigan and, and they're running neck and neck. And he said that in his, when Trump said in his final uh, speech in Minnesota, he flew to Minnesota for a final speech after he'd been campaigning nearly two years, a year and a half, 18 months. 31,000 people waited till 1 o'clock in the morning to hear the man speak. And he thanked them all for staying up so late. He said, this is the final speech after 18 months. He said, we've done the best we know to do. He said, and the polls are saying she's ahead. So tomorrow I may go back to Trump Tower. He said, if, if I do, he said, uh, I'll just put myself back in business. And I can tell you that I have left, I've left it all on the campaign trail, everything. He said, I'm completely, totally spent. He said, but they have her five points ahead. He said, but then looking at you guys tonight, he says, it just does not feel like second place. <laughs> he said he went back to his hotel room that night <clears throat> waiting for the uh, election results. And the first thing that came into his mind and his heart when Melania came in and sat down over on a sofa and covered up to read a little bit and they were going to talk, he said, I looked at her and, and thought of something she said to me the night that he announced to his family he was going to run. He said, I hadn't thought about it since. He said, she he had told the family he was going to run for president <clears throat> and made the decision said what he was going to have to do. Everybody's life would change. Uh, Secret Service would be around them for the rest of their lives. And uh, he said it'll be, it'll be a tough run. He said we're coming up against somebody that is her, it is her manifest destiny to become president of the United States. He said Melania crawled over there on, onto the end of the sofa with him and put her arms around him and said, you know that when you run, you will win. <laughs> he said, I hadn't thought of it since until the night that was the last speech. He said, all the family came over. He said, and that night was electric. The election results were coming in. He said, and boom, we take Florida and all the Electoral College votes, and then we take Georgia, and we take the ones we're expecting to take. He said, but Ohio, there's not been a president be elected not winning Ohio in the last 14 elections. And he said, Ohio was neck and neck, and Michigan, and then Pennsylvania, and he said, all these must-have must states. He said, and we began to clip them down one after another, after another, after another. And he said, I began to think, we got a chance to make America great again. Do you do realize that God's divine hand of providence is on our nation? And I'll tell you why I mean that. Israel rose, raised up because God loved Israel. Egypt was raised up because he called Egypt my people. You can go nation after nation after nation where God raised up nations because he loved them. America is the only nation on the earth that men came over here and established a nation, one nation under God, because men loved him. That is the difference in America. That is the reason why there's American exceptionalism. This was a nation that started because we loved God. 
we wanted to worship him. And the reason why we have a, a constitutional amendment of freedom of assembly is not so you can go out and uh, riot and have a, they call it freedom of expression and freedom of speech. They've got those all muddy together. Freedom of assembly means that you can come in this church right here and you can preach from this Bible without no, with not, with, without a single person coming in here with guns telling you you can't do it. This is our constitutional right. To, did you hear where states are adopting Bible lessons back in high schools again? Yeah. It's sweeping the nation. And Trump tweeted the other day, he said, finally, we're going to turn it around. That's the first time we've had a president since Ronald Reagan that called 1983 the year of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Let's pray together. Let's just lift our hands and thank him. Thank him that we live in a country that, that where we, we have the right and the freedom to do as we please here and worship God and, and love our neighbor and, and uh, pursue happiness and and we have such abundance within just almost a mile from here. There are stores that are filled with food and just have such abundance, such liberty and such abundance. We're so blessed. And there's not a one of us in here that doesn't have a warm bed waiting on us tonight before, when we go home, waiting for us to be there. Most all of us have a, 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 a heater that's, heating, keeping our house same temperature from one end to the other because we live in America. We're so blessed. Lord, we thank you for this nation. Thank you that it is a nation under God, indivisible, with liberty, with justice for all, a nation and a republic of laws where we're protected. Lord, I'm asking you to give us the wisdom to protect this great republic so that we can do our part. Truly, you have shed your grace on thee, America, America. And you crowned our good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. We thank you for it tonight. Thank you we get to live here, sleep here, work here, get up in the morning here, and worship you here. I would that all nations become like America. I know they're saying... Trump, make Venezuela great again. Trump, make Cuba great again. Trump, make Chile great again. That's what they're saying across the nations. Well, Lord, let it be that they know it's because of Jesus. And Trump is a tool that he uses. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Trump tweeted something the other day. You know, they're fighting him about that wall. I mean, you would think that that $5.7 billion would just break the nation if he spends it. Fighting him about the wall. And it's about the money. It's not about the money. It's about somebody's getting their pockets greased when the drugs come over. You wouldn't know that, would you? Well... He tweeted, he said, after dropping taxes to a historic low, after in the first two years having unemployment, the lowest it's been in, since 1969, after accomplishing the highest employment among blacks and Hispanics since 1969, after, and he named several other things that were accomplished that were landmark accomplishments, he says, does anybody really believe that I'm not going to build the wall? So the wall's going up. And he even said the other day, he said, keep fighting me, it's going to go three feet higher. <laughs> Thank God we finally got somebody that will, he, he said, after saying that we would move the, the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and doing so, he said, he asked, what's it going to cost to put that embassy in Jerusalem and call Jerusalem the capital once again 
of Israel. Best estimates was Mr. President's going to take a billion dollars in seven years. He says, I'd just I'd almost be out of my presidency in seven years. So he got on the phone with some people. He said, we own land over there. Went to looking. He said, found some land that they owned, a building they owned, went in and bought it, refurbished it for $140,000. Did you understand that? And then he said they spent $400,000 getting it completely uh, secure. He said, so for less than $500,000, we've got an embassy. And did it in 18 months. He said, under budget and under time. Sounds like Trump Tower. <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm not here to preach Donald Trump. I'm here to preach the answer to the prayers of the saints is what happened. When the people cry out to God, he'll hear them. Did you know that the Bible says that when the, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice? But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. It doesn't mean that they're just groaning and moaning just because there's wicked people leading the nation. They go into mournful intercession. The wicked in power send Christians to their knees and then things change. So you can be thankful that Christians prayed in response to the wickedness we had in our nation and it gave birth to a better administration. So when God hears from us, you, then He moves. He's waiting to hear from us. So He heard from us. I remember upon the election of the previous president, I thought to myself, well, okay, maybe it's the first time. Maybe, you know, we'll have a, the racial divide in our nation will be addressed and, and surely, uh, you know, the optimist in me said, uh, uh, the I Have a Dream speech in 1963, that was a watershed day for America for civil rights when when uh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream today that one day my daughter will be judged not because of the color of her skin, but for the content of her character. And he, you realize he was an evangelistic voice of revival in the nation. It was called the Civil Rights Movement, but it was a move of God. I thought, well, maybe we're going to see that we're going to judge a person by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin, only to find out the racial divide got worse and they, they inflamed it. It's like, okay, I've got a reason now to inflame racism and division in the nation. And, it just, and I prayed every day for the president. I prayed, God, give him. I used to pray for Bill Clinton a lot. I prayed for Bill Clinton a bunch. I remember Bill Clinton being in China one time when they were impeaching him. They were going to vote and impeach him. And he told the Chinese reporters that asked him about it, he said, well, he said, they may impeach me. He said, but I will not resign. And when he said that, I looked, on, I looked at the television. I said, okay, partner, I can stay with you on that. Don't, don't walk out on me. Stay with it. Let them run you out of town, but, but, but make, them, make them tear your... your presidential seal off the side of the door. I prayed for him a lot. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, prayers, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. When I'd come up against people that didn't want to pray, I'd say, okay, what you're saying is you're willing to set aside peace and godliness. God will move on an ungodly man because godly people pray. Did you know that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord? And he will turn that whithersoever he will. It's the one person that he will reserve the right to violate the man's personal will is the king. And so that hand of God's turning the heart of that king is in direct proportion to the prayers of the saints. So it really doesn't matter who's in the Oval Office. It's a matter of who's willing to pray. I have caught myself praying more. I've prayed more for uh, previous three administrations than I have for this one so far. I don't know why that is. I, I guess I'm just not so alarmed 
as I once was. But that's a, not right. We should pray for him. Man needs prayer. He's not a robot. He's not Superman. He's a man. But I remember when, when Obama was elected, and I remember having those thoughts, I came in my office down here, and I had a row of chairs just like this at the time. I didn't, didn't have my other office chairs in. And I laid across four of those ganged chairs, and I moaned and I groaned and I moaned and groaned and moaned and groaned and groaned for about three hours. And I broke a sweat and <laughs> moaned. And uh, it just took me a while. I felt better. I felt like I moaned something out. I didn't know what it was. And then we trade five Guantanamo terrorists for one deserter. And then we ship a plane load of cash to Iran. Have we lost our mind? This next president comes in and cuts that Iranian deal, just like that. Notice nobody came and asked you, could they send it? They just did it without your consent. So now, do we need to pray for our nation? Do we need to pray for our leaders? Because, you know, your prayers are not praying for them that they have a good night's sleep. Your prayers for them is that by encapsulating them in prayer, they can go to do something wicked and can't reach it. They will be encapsulated, stopped, they'll be hindered, restricted. Amen. Let's go to the book of Romans. And we'll do a quick Bible study and we'll go home tonight. Who in here studies the Bible? Good. You know where you should do the most of your study? The, the lion's share of your study should be between, and any of the Bible's fine, and I don't have a favorite place, but right here in the New Covenant, between See the Old Covenant and some of the New and the back? This part right here is where you need to spend most of your time between Romans and Jude because these are the letters that were written to you, the church. In those letters, you'll get an understanding of God's grace, His mercy, His kindness, His redemption, You'll get the revelation of righteousness that was given to you by the blood. You'll get the Pauline revelation of in Christ Jesus. You'll get instruction as to how you ought to act when you get up and leave out of the church building. There's uh, instruction here to, to, to calm your spirit and you won't be a, a road rager. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of instruction here. There's instruction on marriage. There's instruction on children. There's instruction on how to treat one another. And so I want to center up a little bit here in Romans. There's so many other things that, that you can learn, but I want, I want you to go with me to Romans at the end. Let's go to, let's go to chapter um, 11. Let's dive in the center of chapter 11. I have Jewish friends, friends that are Jews. Are they Christians? Hmm? Is that a trick question? Yeah. <laughs> That's a trick question? Okay. Orthodox Jews are not Christians. People that are heathen, people that have never asked Jesus to come in their heart, are they Christians? They're not Christians? Okay. 
But then Jews, they haven't asked Jesus to come in their heart. They haven't accepted him as the Messiah. But they are moving towards God, aren't they? Are they? Some are, some aren't, maybe. Kind of hard to figure. Well, those are Christians. Yeah. You know, I've wondered about that. Jews for Jesus, that's like sinners for Jesus. <laughs> there are three, there are three na nations, three nationalities that God focuses on. What are the three nationalities? One is the Jew, one is the Gentile, and the other is the Church of God. And the Bible says to not offend any one of them. Don't, don't offend the Jew. Don't offend the Gentile, the one that don't know God. Somebody said, I had a Christian years ago tell me that how he had kind of got one over on this, um, in business, this uh, ungodly meat packer. He said, uh, I'm not going to tell him about his... Uh, well, he bought a bunch of meat, a bunch of processed beef, and uh, he bought 1,190 pounds of it. And when the guy tapped in the computer and typed for the for the for the bill, he didn't hit 11,1190. He hit 190. So he didn't charge him for a thousand pounds. And he said to me, he said, "Ah, he's just no, he's just no heathen anyway." So I'm not gonna tell him. What should that Christian have done? He should have called and said, look, you're trying to give this beef to me or you want me to buy it? And so, uh, so he was going to walk in offense toward that ungodly man. Now, I have this to ask you. If the man's ungodly and, and he made a mistake on the, on the ticket and sold it to a Christian, should the Christian have told the ungodly man? This is not a college ethics class. This is just called being a Christian. Well, interesting thing happened. I told him, I, I said, shared with him, I said, okay, well, you know, I don't know why you're telling me this, but since you brought me in on it, I'd get on the phone and call him if I were you. He said, well, a thousand pounds at, at, at uh, uh, $4.50 a pound? Do you know how much money that is? I said, yeah, it's money that belongs to him. I said, but you, you brought me in on it. I wouldn't say anything. And uh, he said, well, what would you do? I said, get on the phone and call him. I said, you're going to buy it anyway. Just write the check. Nah, he's just an ungodly sinner. I said, oh, and you're a wonderful Christian. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story is later, he called and told me, he said, I don't know what you did. You put a hex on him. Real, he was a real carnal Christian, I'd tell you that. He said, what did you do, put a hex on me? I said, what happened? What did you do? He said, I dreamed all night long cops were coming in my business and, and, the, and the, the, the marshals were coming after me. And, the, and he said, uh, he said, they, he said they, they, they put me in handcuffs all night long. He said, so I got up the next day and realized it was just a dream and it wasn't real. I got on the phone and called the guy. He thanked me. I said, you know what? If he'd found out that you had intentionally ripped him off, he would never want to come to your church. Because natural things have to happen first. So the Bible's full of how you deal with people. It's in, I won't go to it right now, but it's in one of the Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians. He said, not give offense to anyone, to the Jew or to the Gentile or to the church of God. Those are the three nations God deals with. If a gen, let's say, here's a Jew, here's a Gentile, here's the church of God. If the Gentile then becomes a Christian, does he change nationalities? Yes, he does. He becomes a Christian. He's no longer a Gentile. Gentile means without God. Christian means in Christ Jesus. What about the Jew? If he decides to come over here, is he still a Jew or is he a Christian? He's a Christian. And you can hold on to your Jewish ways if you want to. It really don't matter. Christians, 
all that matters. All that matters, there's neither male nor female, there is neither black nor white, there is neither barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's all that matters. Say, I'm a Christian. Christian. Okay. Now, there are certain behaviors that the scripture talks about. <clears throat> in uh, Romans chapter 12, he says these, these words right here. <clears throat> well, we're going to hold your place in 11. I'm going to go to Romans 12 and we'll back up and show you who he's talking to here. He said, I beseech you. Who, who is you here he's talking to? The me. <laughs> the me, the you. Okay. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, look up here at me. There's not three wills of God, but you can find the good will of God, and you can find the acceptable will of God, and you can find the perfect will of God. There are two parts of his will that he's willing to tolerate until you get perfect. <laughs> Good will, acceptable will, and perfect will. And I've been in all three. Some. Some in the, good, in the perfect will of God. Some in the good will of God. And some in the acceptable will of God. He's talking to us here. He says, I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. If you're a Jew, don't think of yourself more highly than the person that was ungodly before he came to Jesus. He said, knowing that God has dealt, think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, let's back up here in chapter 11. He's talking about the Jew and the Gentile. There's a wonderful revelation here. I don't know where to start. Let's start in um, <laughs> go home and do some homework on chapter 11, but I want to read this right here. Verse 13. I speak to you Gentiles. That's us, isn't it? Is, are there any Jews here? Natural born Jews? Or anybody Jew? Anybody? Okay. All right. What about, so then everybody here was Gentile, right? Which meant you were sinner, right? Okay. He's talking to us here. I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Now he's talking about the Jew. If I can provoke to emulation. He said, if the casting away of the Jew, of them, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? See, the Jew was set aside and the Gentile brought in in their place. The, the turning away of the, of the Jew is what gave room for the Gentile to come in. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree, don't boast against the branches. But if you boast... You're not bearing the root. The root's bearing you. Well, look up here at me now. There was a tree. The fatness of the root is who God is. And out of that grew the Jew. And when they didn't follow him by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, he pruned them, cut them off, and they were cast forth like a branch. And then he took the wild olive branch and grafted it in to the root. Now the Gentiles are growing out of the very root where the, Gen where the Jews were originally born. Now, 
Verse 19, you will say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not you. That's in verse 21. Now, come on down. He said, verse 24. Well, go to 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. If you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted in to their own olive tree for I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is the covenant is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, verse 30. For as you in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so these also now not, so even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they may also obtain mercy. Is there anybody in here that can tell me you have not experienced the mercy of God? Is that all of us? See? His mercy saved me. His mercy keeps me. His mercy cleanses me. His mer the Bible says his mercy is renewed every morning. As powerful as his mercy is, he has to renew it on a 24-hour basis because there's probably so much in the earth wearing it down. That's, you know what I'm saying? He says here, they're going to obtain mercy through your mercy. Verse 32, now this is what helps us to understand where we all are. God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all of them. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Who has first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? He said, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. That's where he started to end the book. But then he started with chapter 12 again. Now, here's what I want us to all see. When you read through chapter 12, you'll see now how we should react to each other. I don't care if a man shows up, he's a... He is a Jew or a stark raving sinner or a Christian, it doesn't matter. Our attitude toward people should be the same regardless because the person that comes to me should not dictate my action toward them. What should dictate my action toward them? God's instructions should tell me how to act towards them. So why would I be bigoted and be a certain way to a Jew but be a different way to a Gentile? Why would I tell... Why would I be less toward an ungodly man than I would be toward a Jew? Or why would I be less toward an ungodly man than I would be toward a godly man? Did you know that the sinner, when he feels like that he's accepted in the beloved, it's much easier for him to come to Jesus? He knows you love him. He knows you'll help him. He knows you have compassion on him. Verse 3 of chapter 12. I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Then he tells you about this. The next few verses he's talking about the uh, um, motivational gifts of the Spirit. And come down to verse 16. I want to show you something. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. People that don't have much, people that aren't much in the earth, people that don't have much so social expression, 
just condescend to them. They're, they're just as you are. They're, they're as much a recipient of the mercy of God as you are, or you're as much as they are. He said, condescend to these men. Don't be wise in your own conceit. Repay no man evil for evil. If a man does you wrong, what did the Bible say do? Recompense good for evil. Hard to do. Hard to make yourself do that. You tend to want to pay people back in kind. He said, provide things honest in the sight of all men, as if it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So, therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him drink. In so doing, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You've heard me tell the story before. Um, most of my stories have been told before. Before I was in the ministry full time, I was in interior design. I hung wallpaper for a living. And I enjoyed it. It was good work. In my career, I hung about 15,000 yards of commercial vinyl and about, I don't know, 70,000 household rolls of wallpaper. Many have been the nights that I would be up to 4 o'clock in the morning, blind, tired, eyes crossed, trying to finish up a house down in McDonough, Georgia, before I could come home, or wherever. Um, Hadn't had the church long. I, first, I worked in that business two years after we started the church until I was so tired I was falling asleep on my feet. Those were tired days. I don't remember much of 1994 through 96. <laughs> um, a man, one of my builders called me and said that he had a guy that he knew for a lot of years that was, had a house he was raised in over here in Smyrna and he needed the wallpaper done in it. So went and met the guy. Have you ever had a little twist in your stomach, a little, little knot, like a little check that's at, where you don't really know what the problem is, but there's a little knot? Well, I went with a little knot, but I needed the money, so I went ahead and asked the guy, and he, seemed, he came recommended from a builder I'd known for years. He owned a, a local HVAC business, heating and air conditioning. Big company, I found out later. Found out later that the house that he was renovating was the house he was raised in, and he was just going to rent it. And we were redoing all the wall covering inside it. And I found out that he owned condominiums in Florida along the beach. I found out that he owned property up in the mountains of Colorado and mountains of Georgia. He was wealthy. So this job that I did was, a, you know, about 100 rolls of wall covering at about $10 a roll, so plus with some extra little prep work and stuff. It was about an $1,100 job. It took me about three and a half days to do it. And when I got it done, he began to have every problem in the world with it that was just ridiculous. And he refused to pay me. And then he would forget that he refused to pay me because he did that with a lot of people. And I called him again one day just to ask him if, uh, if any repairs maybe I could do could, to satisfy him. And he had forgotten. He'd already turned me down. He began to say, oh, sure, drop by and I'll uh, get you a check. I'll be here. I'm, now, listen, I'm fixing to leave at 11 o'clock. You'll have to be here by then. So I got there before 11. He had already left. He had forgotten. He would already told me he wasn't going to do it. So he was just a liar. Finally, my house payment comes due, and the due date goes by, and I don't have a check from him, and the job's done. He's satisfied with the work. He's just looking for excuses. Well, the more he did me like that, the madder I got. So finally, I sent Janie over there to collect, because it's harder to tell a woman no than a man. And when I saw just, I mean, this grievous, sick feeling I'd get around his presence, 
The scripture says, do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name wherewith you are called? See, there's nothing wrong with being rich. It's just there's sometimes there's wealthy people that will vex you because they are so high and mighty. And what, as, as God would have it, I'd sit in my truck in the morning up here on Thornton Road eating breakfast and all of his trucks would drive by with the name of his company on the side. And I thought to myself, I'd have to make one phone call, and I, there's, a, there's a, 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 a center boy that lives over in Alabama that's very loyal to me. He'd cut every tire on every truck on it that man owned if, if I called and told him. He'd do it. All I have to do is make one phone call. He'd take a snow chain and spank him. He would. <laughs> he would. And I got to thinking, I thought seriously about it. I never even moved toward a telephone, but I thought about it. And I said, God, I can't have this irritation in my heart. I've got to preach every Sunday. And I've got to minister. But I've got to, the, 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 the priest has to keep his feet barefooted and sensitive. And I can't stay sensitive if I'm this irritated with this guy. So the Lord just told me, he said, well, pray for him. That's all he said, pray for him. And sure enough, all his company trucks started driving by. And every, I had made up my mind every time one of his company trucks would drive by in front of me, I'd pray for the truck, pray for the company. <laughs> I pr if I prayed with gritted teeth, I'm still getting it out. God, help the man prosper his business. <laughs> I just make myself pray. You, sometimes you pray things you know is right, but you don't want to. You know what the number one problem, the number one resistance to the will of God is? The will of men. And I did not want to. But I made myself. We finally got about 70% of the pay and I just decided to write the rest of it off. Come to find out, there was a big warehouse that made the coils and the motors the outdoor units of air conditioner systems with a major AC company. And there was a heist at that warehouse and nobody ever knew who stole all of them. About that same time, his company ran a special on those units. So it was one of those things everybody knew. He's, he's one of the guys that stole them and had, had guys that came and stole them by night, but nobody could prove it. I thought about him the other day when I watched a movie called Getty, story of J. Paul Getty. There was a time Getty was the wealthiest man in the earth. Not only was he the wealthiest man in the world, he was the wealthiest man in the history of the world. And his grandson got kidnapped, demanding a $17 million ransom they interviewed Getty and said, what are you going to do? And he said, nothing. He said, I have 12 grandchildren. If I start to, uh, succumbing to the demands of, of uh, people that, he said, I, I, I'd, I'd invite kidnapping to my entire family. No. They said, well, are you going to offer anything? He said, nothing. Well, then the captors cut the grandson's right ear off and mailed it to him and said, you don't come up with some money now, we'll mail you his foot. They were serious. He was undaunted. And in a meeting with one of his um, personal assistants, he said he'd never seen his boss like this. He asked him, he said, you just finished up this major thing, some business dealing. He said, and it's, it's expanded your wealth through Western Europe. And he said, your wealth is, you're, you're, you're wealthier now than you've ever been. He said, no. He said, I am more vulnerable financially than I have ever been in my life. I can't succumb to the demands of captors. He said, you're the richest man in the world. What would it take 
He looked at him and said, More. You see how covetousness works? Covetousness will drive a person down the pathway to destruction when they think they're actually getting wealthier. Well, one morning, some um, months later, about a year later, I guess, I got up and did like most of you do. I went from the bed to the sofa, found a local newspaper, the local Douglas County Sentinel, picked it up, sat down, and I never do this. I looked, and there were the obituaries, and I thought, okay, let's see if I know anybody that died. And there was his name. I thought, is this the same guy? He said, local HVAC contractor and uh, known in his community of the Baptist faith, as if that many things, all this other stuff, all about him and how wonderful he was and all this stuff. So I made a call to my builder and said, what happened to, and I named him. He said, oh, man, he was in his car. Back in those days, it was a rare thing to have a phone in your car, in your truck. And he had a he, big, big phone in his truck. He said that he called the office the other day going down a, a road right over here on the other side of Thornton Road and said that he started getting slurred speech and he's hard to see the road. He said the, double, the, the yellow line is a double line now. And they said, well, pull over. We'll send some of the guys to come get you. He said, no, I'll, I'll make it. And he drove back and he passed out and came over, crossed over the yellow line, hit another truck head on. And when they found him, his head had been severed from his body. <clears throat> Do you know how glad I was when that happened that I had prayed for him? Do you know how bad I would have felt if I had not prayed for him and he wound up like that? I would have thought I'd have been part of the reason why he died. Don't withhold prayers from your enemies. Don't withhold prayers from people that do you wrong. Just go ahead and pray. Weren't you telling me recently that, that you, I'm talking to you, weren't you telling me recently, <laughs> weren't you telling me recently that you were being moved on by the Lord to pray for a certain person you didn't want to pray for? No, I didn't. Did you pray anyway? I couldn't help it. Okay, good. I resisted that temptation that I had been avenged because it wasn't just my few hundred bucks. Most of it, not all of it. And it wasn't that my house payment ran 30 days late. See, Part of my problem was I was out of the will of God. I had extended my business that I'd had for 15 years. It's hard to turn loose of that when you've got a, a white knuckle grip on it. I had, God had to peel my hands off of my business to make me give it to him so I'd go into full-time ministry. And no, no, I, I, at first I resisted the temptation. First thought was, well, good enough for you. But then I thought, that's... I felt like David when I cut the hem of Saul's garment and my heart smote me. I thought, I can't think like that. That's how he got there. He got there by conniving, by sending guys out at night, breaking into warehouses, and he'd get, he paid himself out of other financial problems and legal issues. He'd had, you get enough money, you can buy your way out of anything. And uh, so... Um, I do think that God gives you a long window of opportunity. And you know what? When I see in the scripture where the new covenant, can you think of any place in the new covenant where judgment and death came on somebody because of they had missed the will of God? In the new covenant? There's one place in the new covenant where judgment came. It was on Ananias and Sapphira. And what was it about? They sold land to give to the church to get this fledgling little church up and going. And they came in, and, he, and Peter was there, and he said, they, whatever, they, they had houses and lands and whatever sold it. They laid it at the apostles' feet. And um, Ananias came in. He said, did you sell the house for so much? Yeah, for so much. It didn't mean it, he sold the land and brought a portion of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But they told him this amount is what we sold it for. They kept back part of it. 
If Peter just came in and said, look, we've sold this land, we've sold it for $100,000, we're going to keep 50000 of it, and you can have 50000 that would have been fine. But he came in and said that they sold it for whatever the amount was. That was a lie. He said, you've not lied to, to men but unto God. He said, now the feet of them that's going to bury you are at the door, and they're going to come in. And he fell down straightway and gave up the ghost. They picked him up, carried him out, and buried him. Three hours later, his wife came in. Guess where she'd been for three hours? Shopping. Shopping. She'd, been to, she'd been to Arbor Place Mall. <laughs> Sister Sapphira, did you sell the land for so much? That's a loaded question. They were privy to, the two, she and her husband, to what they were going to say. She said, yay, for so much. He said, mistake. The guys that just buried your husband are going to come in, they're going to bury you. She dri- fell down straightway, gave up the ghost. They went out and buried her by her husband. You know what the Bible says happened to the church after that? Great fear fell upon the whole church. So, if we're going to do something wrong, don't do it financially. God is really watchful of dollars and cents when it comes to the body of Christ. And it wasn't me. I was just part of it. When, without a lie, he would not do business. Without misrepresenting, he would not do business. So when I went back to my builder that originally referred me to the guy, I told him what happened. I said, uh, did you ever have any problem with him? He says, oh, yeah. He said, he said, when we got him to do work, he would do the work. He said, but we got where we couldn't do business with him. I said, but you had no qualms asking, telling me to go work for him. And I looked at my builder that he said, you know, he just kept calling me and he said, I knew you were a good paper hanger. I figured it couldn't be that much anyway, and I thought, okay. So I began to think for ways that I needed to exit this type of work. And the day came. In the summer of 1996, I was watching the newly established History Channel where the pilgrims came over America and they had, they, you know, the History Channel does a great job with their videography and so forth. These big sailing ships, and I know they're probably computer generated, but they looked real. And they had the guys, they landed and the people got out and they had these ships out there. And he said, in an attempt to be sure that the people weren't tempted to go back to their homeland, the captain ordered all ships to be burned. And so they're watching the burning of these great, I mean, the wooden ships, those things would go up and the flames were unbelievable and the billowing smoke was unbelievable. I was watching that. He said, now, no one is tempted to go back to that which they came from. They're forced to be here and committed to stay in the new, new country, in a new land. And so they had those, they named one, what they named that one place up? Uh, well, they named one place Newfoundland, and they named, um, yeah, the, 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 estab- the new, new established places. And, and so I, when I was watching, I realized what the Lord was telling me. He was telling me that I needed to burn my ships. I've changed from one way of living to another, and I was really cheating the people. I mean, they, I, back in those days when we didn't have cell phones, I finally reluctantly got a pager when that thing was on. Some, anytime somebody caught, paged me, I could tell by the way that pager went off whether it was good news or bad. <clears throat> That's bad news right there. I can tell the way it felt. I had to go find a telephone. And sometimes it would buzz and buzz. And, and I, I didn't have to look at it. I knew it was just trivial. And sure enough, it would be just trivial. But man, if there was something serious and I couldn't get right to a phone, that was not good for the people. So I gathered up all of my ladders and all of my equipment and everything that I own, all my scaffolding and everything, stacked it all up and called my brother who had originally trained me. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm about to, I told him all this other stuff that I had. And he, he liked the type of work that we did and, and he, he liked my uh, expense that I had put, laid out and all of my equipment and he told me about how nice it was at one time and I said, well, you know how nice all this stuff is? He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm about to set fire to it. He said, why? And I told him. I said, unless you come get it. But if you come get it, I'll give it to you. You have every bit of it, the lock, the stock, the barrel, everything. I was going to give him the van, too. 
but I needed it. I said, but if you come get it, you've got to promise me that you will not give it back to me if, if I go bankrupt. He said, I'll be right there. Later, I found some other stuff, and I stacked it off in his yard. And he was true to his word. So I went home and told Janie, I said, I gave Butch all of the equipment today for the, wall, for the professional wall covering installation. Gave it all to She said, why'd you do that? I said, because. And I told her about that History Channel thing. And I said, so. She said, well, what are we going to do? I said, well, what's in the church account? She said, there's $650. I said, write your pastor a check for $500. She said, John. I said, right, Alexander. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I know I need to spell it. <laughs> John. Yes, Alexander. He wrote the check. I put it with a little deposit. Handed it back to us and put that in our personal account. I drove to the church office, put the key in the door the next morning at 9 o'clock. seemed like the sun was straight up. I'd never gone to work that late in my life. Get on the job before daybreak and then get in the house. It's ice cold and you get your ready heater blowing and try to get that bathroom warmed up enough so you can go up with the wall covering. And so at 9 o'clock, I put the key in the door and I turned around and looked to see if somebody was watching me. <laughs> Maybe I was doing something wrong. I went into the, the um, office, opened my Bible, and got my study helps out, and made a pot of coffee, which, you know, the stainless steel boiler tool, mm -hmm. 1996, is standard equipment to go into full-time ministry. I sat down. I'll never forget it. I said, Private First Class John Alexander reporting for duty, sir. And when I sat down, he said these words to me. Well, finally. Two words. Well, finally. And he told me he had originally called me to do this full time ten years before. I was in a church in Mableton. We were called to an altar of prayer and went down. We all knelt. We were all praying. I didn't know what anybody was praying about. He just asked us to come pray. I said, well, Lord, I said, if you got me called to ministry, what am I called to do? What do you want me to do? I was praying in the spirit there for a little bit. And then he said, what I have you to do, you'll find outlined in the scripture concerning King Hezekiah. I didn't know that I had ever read about King Hezekiah at the time. And I thought, okay, that was neat. I got up, went back and sat down. I thought, well, sometimes you go pray. If you hear from God one time, your prayer time's over with. You can pray, pray rest of the evening if you want to, but usually you'll only hear from him one time about something. That's been my experience. So I went back and sat down. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. I was just thinking by myself. And there was a girl that was praying. A lady had several kids. Her name was Marcy Price. And Marcy was one of those high-energy kind of Christians that, that she could hear from God, but she was flaky too. You know, that's most of us. She said... Can I testify, Pastor? He said, well, certainly, Marcy. Said, I was praying and the Lord spoke to me and said that he was going to raise up one here like unto King Hezekiah. I thought, well, that's what I just heard. That's great. All right, we're getting ready to go home. It's 8 o'clock, but I'm going to say this to you. I went home and read through the scripture and found where this king, this particular king had died and his son Hezekiah reigned in his stead. And he said he began to be 25 years old when he began to reign. And I looked and looked at the calendar. I was 24 years old in eight months. And I thought, that was, now fast forward to 10 years later when the Lord spoke to me and said, 
well, not 10 years later, many years later, said to me, I told you to do this years ago when you were 25. He said, you finally went at 35. Now, let us redeem the time together. So he's redeemed the time. He can, no matter how you, wherever you show up late, he can catapult you to the right time. Amen. Because it's not our agenda anyway. It's his. Let's all lift our hands. Father, thank you for your hand in the affairs of men. We, are, we marvel that the God that created all things could even use us or would be willing to. You certainly don't need us, but you've chosen to use us. So we'll answer your call. And we'll do so fearlessly. We'll not be afraid. We'll go from glory to glory to glory to assignment to assignment to assignment because it is therein that we'll find peace, we'll find the will of God, we'll find the blessing and the victory that only comes by being in the center of your will. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I love y'all.